Uh, my name is Rick Vanover. I'm with Veeam. I function as an evangelist. Simply put, I try to tell people to do better things with their data in a, in a way. Um, my topic here for today is availability in the era of ransomware, clouds, and why a legacy backup is not enough. Okay? So I think that um, the ransomware th phenomena is legitimate. Has anybody ever bumped into it or helped someone out of it? You know, uh, you know, vendor alike. If you're using a computer, I think it's it's a risk. And even if you know the existing ones are very Windows centric, there's going to be more. There's going to be other platforms. There's going to be phones. There's going to be other technologies that are going to be at risk of this. And so, you know, the examples I'm going to show are very specific to, you know, maybe operating systems, but the way of thinking is what I want to try to communicate is something that you all can take as a practical way to kind of improve what we do with data. Okay, so I saw something come out from the Wall Street Journal, uh, QR code if you want to go to it, but basically it was about the risk of insider threats. And they, they dropped an infographic, which I'll go into in a second. But it really got me thinking about that. I mean, the thought of an insider threat doesn't necessarily apply to ransomware, but it applies to that access of the data. You know, What could go wrong from an insider threat standpoint? And I'll get to some practical tips around that here in a second. But the, uh, the, the title was, this is a bigger risk than many people may think. You know, when we think about layers, orchestration, automation, scripts, it, you know, the, the puppeteers of these advanced technologies and data centers that we have have a lot of power in those strings. And so this notion of an insider threat or of ransomware or the like, I, I'm curious, you know, how real it is, and it is real. And then when we think about that in specifically to something like backup or availability, you know, of the data center, I think that these are significant considerations. Now, in that article, they also had this really good infographic. And now I love infographics myself. I don't know about you guys, but I do. And there are categories, and I'm going to zoom into this in a second, where around data exfiltration, network activity, compliance stuff, time and expense, personnel, external data, physical security, very big ordeal, um, and then act access attributes, and then a whole bunch of numbers about percentages of people that, you know, admit that they've taken sensitive data out. I've done it, you know, I've put stuff that, like my email, my personal email, I look at the jobs I had in the past, I always saved a PST of that. Everybody ever done that? No, of no. course not. But I mean, the, the, in, in 97, or one of these numbers was really high in that regard, but the important thing is I think that 100% of organizations have had at least one of these things happen. And I think that that's significant, okay? So when we think about this notion of an insider threat, this notion of data, data loss, I, I gravitate the conversation to backup. And more importantly, why just backup isn't enough. So a couple of these I wanted to zoom into. 59% of employees who leave an organization, I've done this, take information with them. Best example is that email, right? 90% uh, of IT employees say that they, uh, if they lost their jobs, they would take information with them. 25% have used email to do such. These are just very interesting numbers in, in the sense that, like I said, I think 100% of organizations have had some sort of hit in these or other categories that regard or, you know, what I would call an insider situation, a data loss, unplanned, but even worse, unknown. And I think that's the big problem. So when we think about this type of stuff, and that's just like a news element, right, of this notion of an insider threat, what does this mean for backup? And when I think about backup, there's this old thinking and the new thinking. When, when I grew up in IT, my, my biggest fear, right, was a tape falling off the truck. It's, it's actually still a risk. But now with our advanced data centers and the like, we have more things going on, more advanced layers, layers in a good way, not layers in a bad way. I mean, there's layers that can make things bad, but there's a lot of stuff going on, right? And uh, in fact, you know, listening to Giuseppe, like the OpenStack conversation is new to me, but some of the concerns are timeless. And when I think about when 
things can go wrong in regards to backup, in regards to data loss, in regards to ransomware. The surface areas come into play. And I would actually challenge that, you know, a lot of companies, especially those in, you know, financial services or sensitive data, they put a lot of effort to the production state of the data. Any access to production data, very well controlled, right? They might be doing pretty good with that. But I challenge that there's actually a bigger surface area in the backups, because it's all there. And what I mean by that is, are those same controls in place? You know, um, you know this data protection strategy, this data availability strategy, it really has all the data. Does it have the same controls? Is there the visibility to ensure that what should not happen is not happening, those types of things? So that doesn't really come in so much to ransomware, but it comes into this notion of advanced data centers and advanced data movement. Where does the data go? Who's looking at it? Who's touching it? And the like. And I uh, can, you know, count countless examples of conversations I've had with like security people when they talk about the data that's in a backup. Because you know, what I do at Veeam is talk about stuff. And when we do such, we have to answer questions like how data moves, how is it accessed, who can get to it, and the like. So when we look at these surface areas and this, these risk areas, I've long told people this notion of a 3-2-1 rule. And it's not new. But when we think about this notion of ransomware, when we think about this notion of insider threats, we have to take this pretty seriously. Um, the 3 2 one rule is not new, but when we apply it to the threats today, I would actually change it. Okay, so this 3 2 one rule that I've said says you have three different copies of data, two different media, one of which is off-site. I'd like to actually put extra rules in there for these new threats of today. Offline, that would be a good way, right? You know, offline storage for um, some of these threats is a, is a good way to protect. When we look at these, you know, how many ways can you dial this up? You can have uh, tape. That's a good offline storage of sorts. I mean, it's not exactly the most modern of technologies, but the portability, the offline aspect, the acquisition costs are actually pretty good. We also could think about storage snapshots. OK, those are pretty good ways. We could also think about uh, different protocols you know, to kind of make threats have to go out of band by a, a factor of two or more to, to propagate themselves. But when we look at, you know, backups, and I'm always keeping this conversation very operating system, hypervisor focused, because, you know, what, with what Veeam engages with, that's where we protect and, and make data available, right? But when we think about these notions of ransomware, uh, and it's, this is, by the way, not just a PC problem. I know a number of service providers that have, like, uh, they'll use Veeam to protect everything that their clients run. But they have this, like, separate little protocol. Whenever the client calls and says they've got Locky or, or whatever, they kind of break all the rules, and they shut it down immediately, and they restore it back, right? This is actually very much a server problem currently. So this notion of the 3 two, one rule I, I like it, especially with my extra rules about offline and maybe um, out of band permission access, controlled access to it. If you think about the complexity there, that really is good, both from the insider threat and the ransomware threat. But I like this, this way of thinking, no matter what you do with technology, because A, it can accommodate nearly any failure scenario, and it doesn't require any specific technology. So this is more of a way of thinking. Sure, we can do it at Veeam. I love drawing up these types of things. And, and before I forget, if uh, during the lunch or the coffee breaks, if you want to talk more about Veeam stuff, uh, myself and then also Michael and uh, Chris, both from Veeam are here, maybe give a little wave wave. They're both there. If you have any questions, uh, you know, they can talk Veeam with you as well. But this, this rule rocks because it, like I said, it doesn't require any specific technology. It doesn't require you to do anything specific, yet it can accommodate any of these scenarios. But I really kind of want to gravitate to this notion of offline. 
and a couple of attributes come into play. Out of band authentication and communication. I think that those are um, good attributes for this notion of some of these propagating risks that we might have. So out of band communication would be something like um, a disk-based backup that is removed from an online system and then is taken offline. And then to access it, a different set of controls and persons would be allowed to reintroduce that back. So first of all, there's no um, live communication, no you know, replication of sorts when it comes to backups. Yet you've got this <coughs> extra control. And you don't ever want to pull it out of there unless there's a real problem. But you know, some of those types of things can help you um, reduce that risk. And tape's a good example. Uh, the only reason a tape would come out of storage is um, you know, only the CEO could do it or something like that. Because if you think about the insider threat plus the notion of propagation from ransomware, these extra business controls can help you address that. Another kind of offline storage aspect that I want to kind of highlight is, um, and Giuseppe brought up Active Directory. I mean, he said a lot of companies use it. I'd argue it's the single most common authentication framework in business data centers today. Pretty qualified, but I'd, I'd say that that's legit. That's a great way to propagate, OK, because it's the same set of uh, credentials. Sure, we can have people with, with backup approaches that lock in with different uh, usernames and passwords and, and those types of things. But still, Active Directory in itself has a, a risk of permitting propagation. So one of the things I actually have told people is, and, and this comes into a very inceptive moment, um, I used to advise people on how to design their backup storage. And I'd say, you've got all this you know, stuff. You're using Active Directory here. And they have maybe a deduplication appliance or some sort of storage device and how they get to that. They said, well, I'll just use SIFS, logging in through Active Directory. I'm like, eh -eh. what if you're restoring Active Directory? You can't get to it because it, it's in there, but you have to log into the storage with that, which is not there. So there's an inceptive moment. So little things like for backup storage, maybe introduce Linux authentication and NFS protocols or local storage with, with no, uh, well, that would be risk of propagation. But the NFS part in particular would prohibit you know, when you have to change authentication frameworks. Little things like that in the era of ransomware can be simple design changes that actually can make a big difference. Um, and then traversal of authentication, I think that Active Directory is one, it's a great framework, don't get me wrong. But if you take the risk of ransomware insider threat seriously, if you have to have these hard different mechanisms, it becomes a multiplier of complexity to protect against uh, these ransomware and internal threat situations. The, one of the last things I want to hit on, we've got about five minutes left. I'm going to keep us on time. And one of the last things I want to hit on is activities. And what I mean by that is, you know, if anybody uses any product, you know, if you get like a log of what's good, like red, yellow, green, what do you look for? No, no, no. You look at the green. That's, you look at the red and yellow. That's what I'm getting at. But I'd actually argue that the green is just as bad. Let me give you an example. What if um, Joe, the IT intern, did a restore job of the CEO. Well, he shouldn't have permission for this, but that, that's another thing. Joe, the intern, restored the email box of the CIO to his desktop. Well, it was green. It was a totally successful job, right? But what the flip is he doing doing that, right? Or it doesn't have to be Joe, the intern. It could be um, Sue, the semi-disgruntled IT admin, or Wayne, the half-baked OpenStack architect that doesn't know what they're doing, whatever. There can be successful uh, activities that, was that a 10, Enrico? OK, there can be successful activities that actually indicate a problem. So I, th I know a lot of people that sort by the reds and the yellows and triage that. But I would actually argue that the greens are good as well. And you know, whatever you do, it could be um, a storage practice. This is beyond backup. What if somebody deployed a new LUN? But then you look a little closer, what the heck is that person doing with storage? You know, those types of things. So th this is the visibility aspect is what I'm getting at. 
who's doing what. When you look at the notion of an insider threat, when it, and then you know, coupled with the risk of ransomware, coupled with the advanced data center technologies we have today, I'd actually argue that the good stuff is just as bad as the bad stuff. Kind of a scary thing. And this notion of redirection, this is uh, one thing that I've had happen where a lot of people have you know, data, again, that surface area, it's all backed up, but what about the restore? I'd argue that the actual no task of restoring data is a pretty significant event. Sure, it gets you out of a problem, but the, there's a lot of conversations that come through that. Did they restore the right data? Were they allowed to restore the data? But more importantly, did they restore it back in the right place? This notion of redirection, I'll take the CEO again. If he has a file called payroll.xls, it's probably important. And if somebody restored it, not back to where it came from, but again to their desktop, that's bad news. Or if people are taking backups home, you know, on USB drives, et cetera. So we have to work, when we look at the data center and the data we have, we have to work backwards. What access would allow one to do that? What storage is in place that allows backup stuff to do that, right? So I have to kind of point to people to draw the lines of their data center, identify their data, look at their flows, look at their patterns, look at their architecture, and my 3 2 one, one, one rule is pretty nice with one being off-site and offline and with um, out-of-band access control. When you look, about a, look at it that way, that 3 2 one rule can really help you protect against all of these threats, ransomware, um, insider threats, and more. And then when we look at old, out-of-date inventory, I'd highlight that that's actually a big deal. Um, there might be a point in time of backups on disk or tape or the old backup software might not have the same access controls, but it still has all the data, granted, old. But then again, that's just a surface area that I'd encourage you, you know, to, to be aware of. And as we round out, you know, this notion of cloud and service provider technologies, you know, this is another era where we have to do things like if we're going to go down the cloud and service provider model, which is inevitable, don't get me wrong, um, I encourage people to look at practices like BYOE, bring your own encryption. I encourage people to um, look at the cloud and service provider technology, not just because they have to. And what I mean by that is I get the question all the time, okay, I need to do cloud for my backups. And I'm like, what do you mean do cloud? I'm like, well, you know, yeah, yeah Amazon and Azure, yeah, that. Uh -huh. And I'm like, okay, wh what do you want to do with it? You know, last time I looked at Amazon, is there 78 different services, Nigel, or something like that? So, okay, you can run a VM, you can do an object storage, you can use the RabbitMQ, what do you want to do? And that rhymes. But um, the same thing with the Azure example. Uh, Giuseppe brought up that example where Somebody was given part of their ELA, a large amount of credits, therefore have to use it. How are you going to do it? So my practical advice is to when you go down a cloud and service provider technology path, know your surface areas. The one practical tip, BYOE, bring your own encryption. And then lastly, um, be able to draw your lines of your data so that when it goes to that cloud and service provider model, you have a full awareness of what you're doing. Because I, it's a real risk. I think a lot of people just I don't want to say go drunk into the cloud, but go blind into the cloud. And then, you know, as we wrap up here, I got four and a half minutes, or four minutes and six seconds. Um, I encourage people to provide more than backup, okay? Now, I've done my best to not make this a pitch for Veeam, but right here is kind of the word from our sponsor. A lot of people go to backup products for these two capabilities, high speed recovery and data loss avoidance. That's why people buy backups. But in this world today, I don't think that's enough. I challenge everyone when they look at their data to introduce things like verified recoverability, leveraged data, and actually at the very end is most important, having complete visibility. Having visibility into who restored what and why. You know, it was a successful job. It wasn't yellow or red, but why did Joe, Wayne, or Sue get into that data? Right? Those are significant questions. Um, also, questions like, 
you know, how much time do we have left before we run out of space? We don't want to do guesswork. We don't want to over permission, things like that. This is, that's the, this is the transition from just backup to availability. And when we look at our capabilities in the market today, and granted, the Veeam answer today is very much focused on Windows and Linux operating systems as well as VMware and Hyper-V VMs. But this, this mindset, this practice is going to evolve over time. And whatever we're looking at with modern technologies, I encourage us to just take this modern approach to the surface areas, to the risks, and, and such. So with that, I have a moment or two for questions. Any questions on anything that I've talked about? Oh, whoa, Julian. Well, no, they're recording, so, yeah. Oh, you don't have the password. <laughs> there you go. It's not in Active Directory. <laughs> <laughs> it's out of yeah. band. <laughs> Bring your own password. Um, these kind of issues, which I think were well put about um, where your data sits and where you can, for example, restore um, the CIO's email box, is that a business process thing or not just a pun for Veeam, or is that something that backup products are going to bake into that there's going to be some sort of policy-driven thing about not where you can back things up, but where you can potentially restore it to and who can restore it and all that kind of thing? Three answers. Yes, no, and it depends. Now, what I mean by that is any product can do any level of sophistication. It can be fully process-driven, and it can be a capability somebody doesn't have. It's how it's implemented. I was telling Nigel just a moment ago, it's like going through an audit. It's like, oh, I'm using this technology. Well, that doesn't by itself mean that it is or isn't going to let you pass that audit. It's how it's implemented. That, that's the answer. The implementation, again, knowing that surface area, knowing the requirements, knowing maybe we do live in a world where we have policy driven as a requirement, that'll make the difference to that answer to the question. Good question. Uh, was it you? Yeah. Could you pass this back, guys? I didn't turn it off. Yeah, sorry. Um, you mentioned bring your own encryption. Can you explain what you mean? Mm. If I'm going to cloud, I believe that my data is encrypted in the cloud. Right. Are you talking about taking our own encryption on top of what the cloud uh, provider actually does? Um, that's an, an option. Um, this, the best example that I can give you, um, specifically for backup data, is that when you, uh, Alex, can you pass the mic back? When you send data, in, in the form of a backup to a cloud and service provider technology, do you have the encryption, therefore the provider cannot see it? That's the test, okay? The worst example is Dropbox. They can open it up, okay? Best example, this is a Veeam technology. We have this thing called Cloud Connect. When I put my backups in a service provider cl cloud, if I'm the customer, I have the password, they don't. That's a specific Veeam example. But BYOE for cloud and service technologies, cloud and service provider technologies is a good approach for today.